Good morning or evening to some of you. My name is Sarah Samuels and I'm the HBS Axiom Program Manager at the Center for Financial Inclusion at Axiom International. Thank you all so much for joining us. First off, I, I want to acknowledge that this is the first time that we've brought all of you together in one space and it is so exciting to see such an astounding turnout. Uh, 104 alumni actually registered for this webinar, which just goes to show you the significant impact that the program has had and continues to have. I also want to share some notable statistics on the HBS program, which is now going into its 11th year, and its reputation is as strong as ever, thanks to all of you. Over the past 10 years, we have had 660 program participants representing just over 400 countries, or excuse me, institutions from over 90 countries. We're especially excited to bring you all together during the first annual Financial Inclusion 2020 week, which, during which stakeholders across the globe are discussing key actions needed to advance financial inclusion in their context. Before we get started, I'd like to share the center's definition of financial inclusion, which expands the focus beyond access to quality. And it's important to us that you be the champions of this definition so we can one day reach our vision of financial inclusion for all. The focus of today's webinar will be progress towards financial inclusion. To begin, I'm thrilled to welcome Elizabeth Ryan, the Managing Director of the Center for Financial Inclusion, who will present an overview of the Financial Inclusion 2020 Progress Report. We intend for this webinar to be as participatory as possible, and we'll have designated time for questions following Beth's presentation, but please feel free to type questions throughout and I'll be tracking them. And finally, just a quick housekeeping note before I turn it over to Beth, to please keep your microphones on mute if you are not speaking. And I will now let Beth take it from here. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, it was great to see that photograph of everybody lined up uh, in front of the, um, the steps, and I'm wondering how many of you still use your red vests. I know I use mine all the time. <laughs> it's perfect for fall and spring weather, um, and it's got good memories associated with it. Um, so what I wanted to share with you is the... Um, Financial Inclusion 2020 Progress Report that we have done at the center, trying to look across the big items that are necessary to move financial inclusion forward. And we, we looked at um, what's happening all over the world, who's doing exciting things, but then also stepped back and said, really, if we match up what's happening, to the scope of the need, how far are we, uh, how well are we advancing, and are we heading in the right direction? So this uh, progress report is a companion piece to a piece that we did um, earlier in the year called By the Numbers. And By the Numbers is looking at the actual data on um, trends in financial inclusion, whereas the progress report is looking at um, more a qualitative look at what needs to happen. So um, what you see there is the home page of the progress report and you can see that the progress report is actually broken down into five topic areas, each of which is one of the key uh, drivers of financial inclusion. Um, and what you can also see is that there are scores associated with each of these areas. The scores on the left represent our assessment of how well the world has been doing in the last few years in making progress to close the gaps in each of these areas. And the scores on the right represent the people's vote or um, individuals voting, and we'll ask you to do that a little bit later in the webinar, um, giving their own opinion. So we'll start with addressing customer needs. Um, you'll see that we've given this area a score of 3 out of 10, um, but the people's vote seems to be, I think we're a little bit overly pessimistic here. Um, when we look at uh, customer needs, we start with the, the 
basic issue, which comes out of the data from the global Findex, that um, people um, in developing countries have been increasing in terms of um, their access to accounts. Access to accounts has been rising. Um, we have data from 2011 and data from 2014. In each case, there are more accounts. Overall in the world, according to the Findex, there are 700 million additional people with accounts in between 2011 and 2014. And that's really quite a rapid rate of increase. But when we look closer at this, we see that the people, that many of these accounts are not active. Um, if you look at the blue lines, the, the light blue, you see um, essentially dormant accounts. They have an account, but they don't use it. The dark blue represents people who use their accounts rarely. Um, they, they use them once or twice um, a month. And on the left, you see deposits, and on the right is withdrawals. And then the orange represents people who actively use their accounts. And that is defined as making three or more transactions in a month using the account. So what we see, if you look on the right, you see that people in high income countries use their accounts all the time. Um, two thirds of the people um, with accounts uh, use them more than three times a month. Um, and that's shown by the tall orange lines on the right. But then when you look across and you see the um, lower middle income, upper middle income and low income people, there are very, very few of them actually use their accounts the same way that people in high income countries do. And so what does that tell us? That tells us that, um, uh, that we're missing the mark in some way. We're, the, the, the accounts are there, but they're not serving the function. In fact, many of them may be serving the function for um, the provide the payers who want to use the account to give somebody a salary or a benefit check, um, but not necessarily something that the customers are really eager to use. So what's to be done? Um, one one place to start is to see is to recognize that the base of the pyramid isn't just one market. Um, there really are a lot of segments in the market. And so one of the things that we, we believe needs to happen a lot more is to begin to treat this market as multiple, multiple segments and take um, differing needs and capabilities into account. Um, one of the easiest and, and possibly most fruitful ways to do that is to segment by uh, life cycle because financial needs change throughout the life cycle. Um, and uh, we do see some ex successful examples of uh, financial institutions that um, divide their or divide their audience or their uh, target population this way and um, address different pro products to different life cycle stages. Um, one of the... Um, one of the things that's making it possible to do more segmentation is um, the ability to manage data much, much better and um, to both have more data and to manipulate it in order to um, segment customer needs much more. Here's an example. Jana Lakshmi, uh, a microfinance institution in India, um, has been working with CGAP to develop what they call Kaleido, which is based on an um, an interview that they have with clients and which then segments them according to various aspects of their lives. And, uh, and Jana Lakshmi has been using this to, um, to design individual projects, or uh, products, excuse me. So moving to the next area, um, when we look at the, the issue of the access usage gap that we illustrated um, a minute ago, um, one of the you can you need to look at that side that from both sides and one side of course is what are the providers providing but the other side is how capable are, are the customers and what can be done to support the customers to become more capable um, the scale of this challenge is enormous and the response is not commensurate with the challenge which is why we gave it such a low score um, and so the message that we have 
uh, specifically around financial capability is that uh, we need more in interventions that focus on behavior that turns knowledge into use. Um, there are um, a number of things that, that have been discovered, especially through the um, help of behavioral economics, um, which help us understand how to provide financial education, or we prefer the term financial capability, interventions that are um, effective, that use behavioral principles in their design, and that focus on um, actually having people apply the information that they've received. Because the basic problem has been that you spend a lot of money training people, and they, they go home and don't do what you were eager to have them do. Um, so one of the basic principles is to deliver financial cap cap capability interventions at te teachable moments. And that tends to mean at the very time when people are making a financial decision or carrying out a financial um, transaction. Um, so a good example of that is um, KGFS, which um, is a a microfinance organization, again, working in India. Um, and um, for full disclosure, um, Axion is an investor in IFMR, which is the parent of KGFS. Um, but we, one of the reasons we invested is because we like KGFS. Um, so KGFS pairs a personal diagnostic of financial service needs of, a, of each individual family and then offers a tailored suite of financial services. Um, so it is delivering um, a much more personalized and um, appropriate for that particular person set of products. And at the same time, the person comes to understand more about what kinds of products, financial products make sense for them. Um, another example is uh, Saber, Saber es Poder, which is a, um, an organization, it's a nonprofit working in the U.S., and it's using this principle of teachable moments to get um, in touch through social service agencies and consulates with people who are recent immigrants uh, into the U.S., recognizing that people who have um, recently immigrated face a certain set of financial problems or challenges, and it assists them directly to um, to work on those challenges. So it um, helps them connect with banks and understand uh, the way banks work in the U.S. or uh, what kinds of features their bank accounts are likely to have, et cetera. Um, so these are just a couple of, of what we see in the landscape of financial capability interventions that we, we think are on the right track, but unfortunately they're the, the number of those interventions is still way too low compared to the need. Um, of course, we want to make sure that we have um, quality if we are extending access. And um, part of the gap, we assume, is the lack of quality. Um, and in, in many countries, we know that that uh, quality gap has to do with the lack of client protection. Um, what we have seen is that there is quite a lot of activity in some areas of client protection. Um, so when we look at client protection, um, we always talk about the three-legged stool um, where client protection, clients are protected when providers, regulators, and consumers are all aware and doing their bit to, uh, to make sure that um, clients receive appropriate products and use them appropriately. Um, while we, um, what we have seen is that the um, consumer side of the three-legged stool is essentially missing. There's very, very little work in developing countries that allows consumers to raise their voice and advocate on their behalf. We think this is an area that could be uh, really ripe for development and certainly new technologies for communicating with consumers cheaply um, online and in various ways make it more possible for this to happen. Um, 
We also see that um, providers need to do a lot more, that providers need to commit to consumer protection standards and put them into practice in a proactive way. Um, and then um, finally, the regulators really are moving in. We want to see them um, putting in, in consumer protection um, regimes in places where they do not exist or are extremely weak. Um, on the other hand, they do need to do this in keeping with the providers so as not to um, throw the baby out with the bathwater, I guess is the thing you say. Um, and certainly as we look at what's happening with digital financial services emerging, new risks come up um, with that. Um, one of the things that we're excited about and a, and, a, and a really good example of providers taking um, the initiative that we'd like to see is that GSMA has, has recently come out with its own code of conduct for mo mobile money providers. Um, and um, this is dealing with the new issues that are arising with digital financial services around privacy, um, security, um, quality of agent transactions. Um, and uh, GSMA has put this code out and are now working on how to um, get the code implemented within the MNOs that they work with. Um, of course, I couldn't um, be here without noting that the SMART campaign is one of the most important um, provider-based initiatives, and it's um, one that we uh, operate here at the center. Um, and uh, through through the SMART Campaign Certification Program, the microfinance industry is um, upgrading its standards and, and one by one, institution by institution, um, getting up to a level in which a public certification of their um, complying with standards is possible. Um, moving on to the next topic that we looked at, um, credit reporting is, um, Credit reporting tends to be forgotten a little bit in the financial inclusion debates, and we want to keep it on the high, uh, high level um, radar screen because um, we have seen that um, better credit reporting leads to more borrowers and, a, and a, a more orderly marketplace. If we look at the next chart, we see um, that there is a correlation between strong credit reporting systems as rated by the, the global microscope um, and borrowing activity according to the FINDEX. So um, more credit bureaus, the more credit bureaus there are, the more likely people are to be actively borrowing from financial institutions. Um, but um, Traditional credit bureaus are not the only thing happening in this area. There's also quite a bit of activity in um, use of data analytics that use algorithms to identify credit worthy people that might otherwise be left out. Um, this space has quite a bit of um, promise, but at the same time, this is a, an area where regulators need to keep an eye out um, to, to make sure that this um, really is living up to and to its promise. The one area that seems very, very clear that should move forward is the use of alternative data from utilities, rent payments, cell phone usage, et cetera. Um, integration of that data into uh, credit scoring is, um, uh, we, we think of it as a no-brainer. It can be, a, um, using this kind of data can really help provide an on-ramp for people who are otherwise excluded and have um, no formal credit history. Um, an example of an organization that's doing this is First Access in Tanzania. It uses prepaid mobile phone history um, to assess credit worthiness for uh, microfinance institutions, um, which lowers the cost to the financial institution and helps bring in customers that um, don't have either credit history or collateral. Um, so, we saved technology for last, and technology, if you see, we've given it the highest score, um, and a score of a seven really represents a, a, quite a bit of optimism. Um, 
moving to the this graph, what what you see in this graph is um, the dramatic access, uh, the dramatic increase in different types of access that um, technology is bringing. The bottom line that is the orange line at the bottom are bank branches, and of course they are grow. There are more bank branches, but it's very slow, growing very slowly. Um, and then you see that um, ATMs and um, uh, agent banking agents are outlets are growing much faster. But of course, all of those outlets are totally dwarfed by the the reach of um, cell phones, which you see in the the higher um, the higher line. Um, and so. Um, this is basically just to, to show that the technology of access is um, being solved immediately and um, or if we think of immediately as within the next few years. Um, and why is that? I think this this evidence of how much it costs to um, set up a new branch versus how much it costs to set up an additional agent with a mobile phone. Um, at this is the marginal cost. Of course, um, the differences are so overwhelming that um, it's it's um, the, the question then becomes um, how are those how is that cost savings going to result in either expansion to people who could know, who whose income is previously too low or um, uh, reduction in cost to transact. Um, but what we're seeing is that because the numbers are so exciting, we are sometimes looking at um, massive expansion of access without sufficient quality. And so when we look at what do we see that needs to happen in this area, it, um, it has to do with provide, making sure that the that as access is expanded, that um, quality is um, that there is sufficient attention to quality. Um, so, if we move to look at a, an, an example of, of this uh, that we think is um, a good one, um, Tigo, uh, the mobile operator, Tigo has a pr product called. Sudinero, which um, uh, it has worked on with a very wide range of um, players in, in Colombia, Sucatel, Microfinance Opportunities, and DAI, um, using the platform at, at uh, Facebook's Internet Org. So um, another example of what we are seeing that we like is um, the test and learn approach that uh, the Central Bank of the Philippines has been following, which involves looking, uh, allowing things to happen and um, allowing the regulation essentially to follow the innovation. Um, and of course, it's this test and learn approach that has enabled the spread of mobile money everywhere, um, starting in Kenya. Um, we still see that Regulators are, um, con in many cases, overly concerned about um, allowing the innovation to happen, and/or they create the innovation or they create the policy frameworks without sufficient, sufficiently understanding who's an innovator, or they close off the opportunities by um, preemptively putting in place regulation that fits for one first mover provider, but doesn't allow an industry to develop. So um, what we are really looking for is regulators that take this test and learn approach, um, which is a fairly sophisticated approach of, of dialoguing with the industry. Um, that is our scorecard, um, our report on the global state of um, what's been happening in financial inclusion over the past few years. Um, I think it's time for you Thank all you. to vote if you would like. Yes.
That's correct. Thank you so much, Beth. And thanks to all of you who have already submitted some questions. Before we move on to answering them and hearing from a few HBS alumni, I want to take a quick break to give you all the opportunity to go on the site and vote. Uh, you'll find the link in the comments box and you can click directly on the link or visit fi2020progressreport.org. And we'll give you about two minutes to go ahead and do that. Great. Now I'm incredibly excited to welcome a few of your fellow HBS program alumni to comment on one or few of the roadmap areas and the progress that they are seeing in their own industry contexts. First, I'd like to welcome Prabhat Lab, who is Program Manager for Financial Inclusion at the MasterCard Foundation. Prabhat will be commenting on addressing customer needs. And then we'll have David Kambani, the Regional Director of West and Southern Africa for Vision Fund International, commenting on digital technology. And following David, we had Anthony Randazzo, Project Finance Specialist at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, Corporation, also commenting on technology. So I will now turn it over to Prabhat. Thanks, Sarah, uh, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, That's fantastic, and it was lovely to go through the entire 2020 progress report. Uh, you know, uh, a big applause, uh, you know, for CFI and Axion to put together this this progress report in a very accessible format. I think you know, I love the presentation. You know, the way it has been done. Uh, you know, completely online using graphics and you know, very simple illustrations. So, congrats, congrats for that. Uh, coming specifically to uh, you know the area I mentioned, you know I will be happy to comment about addressing customer needs. Uh, you know what is you know and and you know again thanks for you know having you know a somewhat harsh but very honest uh, you know ranking or progress index of your know, rank of three you know on a scale of, score of zero to ten, uh, which is certainly not flattering for the financial service providers uh, across the globe. And I think that's that's an important uh, you know reminder, or you know should be seen as a wake up call that you know after all this talk about the client centricity, customer centricity, uh, you know, human centered product design, behavioral economics, and all of that, you know what is preventing us from making you know a significant progress on on this? Uh, you know, if if we look at you know the progress made in the last two decades, at least in terms of uh, you know how institutions position themselves, there has been a huge shift. We see shifts from say microcredit institutions to microfinance, microfinance to financial inclusion. We saw this recognition and realization that you know credit only will not solve all the problems, and hence the need to move towards savings and you know payments and a huge progress on on those accounts. But as Beth pointed out. The, you know, uptake of accounts is one thing, but usage is, is is very, very low. And in fact, we are seeing an uptick in the number or proportion of dormant accounts, which is a worrying sign and perhaps a clear evidence that we are not able to do enough in addressing the customer needs. Uh, you know, uh, we, we all talk about the stupendous success of M-Pesa, uh, and and you know, and and the report of course mentions about this that, 
you know, M-Pesa people did not start, you know, making transfers because M-Pesa arrived. People were always making those transfers, uh, you know, uh, using other less efficient and less convenient and more expensive uh, mechanisms. And then M-Pesa came and it offered a, you know, a scalable, efficient, uh, convenient way to transfer the money, send money home. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, why we see millions of people taking up M-Pesa so soon, so fast. But, you know, what worries me is that, you know, the great uptake of, uh, you know, mobile payments or, you know, technology enabled kind of, uh, you know, things, you know, positioned as a huge success of the financial inclusion story. I think we are, we, we got to challenge ourselves that, you know, mere access to a payment account or, uh, or, or an, an, an e-wallet is not financial inclusion. The journey, uh, you know, towards meeting all the customer needs uh, is, is much longer. And that will require, in my view, you know, much greater collaboration between different you know, providers. The, the industry itself has become so vibrant. We see fintech companies, we see, uh, you know, MNOs, we see, you know, uh, uh, banks kind of trying to downstream, downscale. We see microfinance institutions convert into deposit taking institutions and go through transformation process. What we can see is that, you know, no one institution can really solve and address all the problems or, or pain points that the customer has. And it is for the financial service providers to really see what they can learn from each other, collaborate in order to deliver a greater value proposition to the clients, which will then lead to greater uptake and usage of financial services. One area where uh, uh, the report itself, you know, great, you know, these five topics that you have chosen for, you know, highlighting uh, is, is fantastic. But I think if you're taking a macro view on the state of uh, progress, uh, you know, in this financial inclusion journey, one area where, you know, uh, we can look, look in future and perhaps, you know, have conversations is uh, to look at the industry architecture. Uh, you know, the, 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 the way we do business is, is changing, you know, changing fast and drastically. And it must change because if existing, you know, organizations and corporations are not able to deliver the value that the customers need, then they must kind of make way for a new set of organizations. Uh, which can deliver the vision that the customers need. And, you know, we, you know, as, as practitioners, donors, funders, need to think what we, what can we do in order to put in place that, you know, more enabling industry architecture, what all is needed in that enabling environment, which can uh, enable the organizations to, to flourish, thrive, and, and, and grow. You know, whether it's investment mechanisms uh, to go into financial inclusion, whether it's about facilitating mergers and acquisitions so that you have, you know, a smaller number of much more stronger players, or how you facilitate, uh, you know, the, the journey from innovation to, to scaling much faster. We see a number of very interesting innovations uh, being, being done, but very few of them actually reach scale. And, and, it's, and it's a kind of missed opportunity, you know, for us not to leverage on, you know, so many of interesting innovations, uh, you know, not seeing the light of the day in terms of scale. I'll stop there. I think I have taken my five minutes, uh, you know, but, but happy to come back later, you know, with, with comments. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Prabhat. We really appreciate your valuable insights. And now we'll turn it over to David Kambani. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, give, good evening, depending on where you are. And uh, it's good to hear the number of uh, Armenians who are with us today. But uh, special greetings to the great class of 2013. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, and uh, thanks to Beth and uh, all the team for putting this uh, report together. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's it's such it's such a good thing that we we have uh, the views of uh, what the financial inclusion team is saying and what the rest of the people who are in the field or the practitioners are also saying. But to talk about digital technology, uh, Prabha has already uh, alluded to a comment I would have wanted to make. That, uh, yes, digital technology, it's doing very well. It has got the highest rating by, by both parties but is it really the all in all that is going to solve uh, matters of financial inclusion? 
I think we must ask ourselves, who is actually using the digital technology? Is it people in the rural areas the most, or is the urban areas? Uh, is it the young or the old, or it's, all, it's everyone else, all the ages included? Is this men and or women? Uh, I would hazard a guess to say people in the rural areas are the ones who are not using this digital technology the most. I say this because for us, our focus is really working with the rural communities. And we have found that they are experiencing challenges. The day-to-day -day challenges is probably stopping them from actually making use of formal financial services. Uh, and it's possible that they are the ones with the many dormant accounts that they've opened. But the day-to-day -day needs are actually stopping them from doing any further, like uh, putting deposits in their accounts as saving for their children's education or health needs and so on, because they are exposed to natural hazards. And, uh, and it, it, it's actually natural hazards and other disasters and shocks, which therefore places new demands on, on, uh, on their lives. So for us uh, in Vision Fund, one of the things that we have actually found it's working well in the rural areas is the use, I mean, uh, it's actually working through the savings groups because there are no costs in terms of actually mobilizing people. In general, in Africa, and it's possible also in other parts of, uh, of, of the world, that people will find it easy to work in groups. They are naturally working in the markets, so they are working together in groups. So it's easier to actually bring them together and teach them the issues of service groups. And, and that way they, they can actually grow and become like a producer associations. And when they're, they've actually reached that level, their level of resilience to actually these shocks is actually improved or is enhanced and they are able to meet their basic needs for the daily livelihoods that becomes a challenge to them on a, on, on, on a daily basis. The other thing that I wish to comment about, which is my experience as well, uh, which I've not seen here, is, is around the environment of interest rate caps. So if financial inclusion is actually looking at, uh, at creating a competitive environment, where we have certain countries where there are interest rate caps, like uh, we experience in West Africa, uh, this inhibits the ability to actually reach out, particularly to the rural areas. We have found that it is very expensive, and the interest rate, rate caps that have been set by these governments uh, is making it difficult for us to actually become sustainable. So it could be that this could be the agenda of uh, FI 2020 to lobby with governments and regulators to actually re uh, remove these interest rate caps because they are not promoting the, the financial inclusion that we would like to see by 2020. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Um, I just wanted to make one comment on your, on your comment, David, which is um, that if you look at the Findex data um, on savings behavior, what you do see, you do see a very striking rise in the um, in savings groups as a means of saving. So they really are on on the rise, and we also see a lot of new um, new technology startups that are um, essentially replicating um, savings groups online. Um, and so that's an exciting development because it allows people that are not in the same place to uh, to form savings groups. Great. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, David. And now I'll turn it over to Anthony Rondazzo. Hello there. Thank you um, for the opportunity to make uh, some comments. Um, I'd also like to speak on the subject of uh, technology. Uh, I think um, it has the really the biggest potential to achieve uh, progress um, in terms of financial inclusion in the microfinance space. Um, and OPIC is 
quite a large player in the microfinance space. We have about $800 million of commitments uh, to microfinance, and that number is likely to go up to a billion um, this calendar year. And, and that is exposure both in terms of direct uh, investments in Tier 1 MFIs and also indirect exposure um, through funds and, and through loans to microfinance networks. Um, we have exposure in about 50 countries. And I can definitely confirm um, the trends that you've outlined uh, in your progress report in terms of how technology is uh, being used. And there's really three trends that we're observing. Uh, one is the use of technology to uh, reduce uh, cash handling from operations. Cash, of course, being um, a key driver of operating costs. Um, and that cash reduction can be achieved in two ways. One, using the mobile payments network to disperse and, and receive loan repayments through the mobile telephones, but also um, through payment cards and uh, agent networks. Um, so that's one trend that we're seeing. Another is the reduction of paper loan applications, um, and in particular, loan officers being um, uh, armed with um, tablets and, and other mobile devices to capture um, new client data directly in the field and, and having that data go directly into the IT systems. Uh, so that is really um, important in terms of improving the loan officer productivity um, and in improving the, the turnaround time for, for loan application approvals. And the third trend that we're seeing is uh, the use of uh, data analytics. Uh, some people call it big data, some people call it alternative data, um, to either improve the credit decision making process or to actually make the, the credit decision outright. So, um, you know, one example of that is uh, a company we recently invested in. We may have a $5 million commitment to a company called Tiaxa. And what Tiaxa does is provides um, small credits. They call them nano credits. Uh, these are uh, credits um, that are $25 or, or, or below that, um, that enable mobile network operators uh, to have their customers um, receive these credits so that their um, prepaid customers uh, don't have their calls drop when their airtime runs out. Um, so what TXA does is it looks at uh, the customer's cell phone data, they look at their top-up patterns and the average top-up amounts and they're able to make uh, credit decisions um, based on, on that data. So that's very uh, interesting and exciting because it means um, you can make uh, loans without cash, without paper, and without the use of humans, which is a, a very interesting development. Um, you mentioned earlier Jana Lakshmi. We also have a, uh, made a $20 million uh, commitment to Jana Lakshmi, um, and part of the key decision uh, there was their um, extensive investment in technology, and in particular, they have a biometric um, enabled technology that allows them to uh, take advantage of the Aadhaar um, biometric identification system in, in, that's being rolled out in India, and that enables them to um, identify their customers and uh, um, eliminate the use or, or eliminate the potential for fraud or, or customer duplication. So, um, and John actually is using technology in other ways too, but um, again, I think these are important trends that we're seeing, and, and I think it, it's potentially game-changing, the, the use of technology, because um, it could ultimately address one of the key criticisms of microfinance, which is around the high interest rates um, that are charged. And I think the sort of traditional industry response to that criticism is that you know it's very expensive to make um, small loans in non-urban areas, uh, in cash, and in countries where you have weak infrastructure. So if technology can um, dramatically reduce the cost of making those loans, um, then Ultimately, that should also translate into lower interest rates. Um, but I think it's going to happen in two phases. I think first we're going to see some early adopters of technology to Im improve um, the depth of their outreach, um, making smaller loans uh, possible uh, for the first time. I think they will also be adopting technology to improve the breadth of their outreach in terms of being able to reach uh, more rural customers, which I think is very exciting. But I think as the technology becomes more widespread because of competitive pressures, I, I'm hoping that this will ultimately also translate into lower interest rates um, and that those cost savings will be passed on to um, the customers. 
unfortunately, I haven't seen any um, evidence of that, but I think it's important for us to watch that and um, to see that that's happening. Because ultimately, that's what matters. We, we want to see more money in the hands of, of the, the customers. So I think, um, in conclusion, I think that um, technology is, is going to become an important part and continue to be an important part of our due diligence. I think it's going to continue to shape um, our pipeline. And if I could just uh, make a few predictions, um, I think that we're going to see a, um, a continuing convergence between fintech and microfinance. I think um, highly automated nano loans will, will uh, be used uh, probably to bring in new customers. Um, but I don't think it will ultimately replace um, the human element. I think uh, microfinance um, will continue to rely on the human element uh, for making lending decisions, um, especially for, for larger loans. And um, I am hopeful that uh, the technology will be used in a prudent manner. I think uh, the technology opens up a number of concerns in terms of data security, data protection. Um, so I'm very glad to, to see that DSMA, DSMA has this um, code of, of conduct. Um, I hope that the technology will continue to become um, user friendly. And um, I hope that the, the increase of technology doesn't uh, lead to um, a flood of new, new credits and, and that could potentially lead to over indebtedness. So that's something we also need to watch. But overall, I'm very optimistic and I, I'm sure that technology will continue to play an important role in, in bringing more of uh, the world's unbanked um, into, into the system. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. And thank you, David and Prabhat. And a number of you have also asked questions and made some comments in the in the comment section. I'm just going to raise a couple of them. The first one is from Barbara Spann. And the question is, do you have future plans to do the same account examination for digital or functional accounts like mobile and cards? They've been touted as a solution to the issue of dormancy, but it's likely we'll see more of the same it would be valuable to know. And I'll let Beth answer that. Yeah, that's a, a, a very interesting question that has a lot of pieces to it, Barbara. Um, thanks for asking. Um, we ourselves at the Center for Financial Inclusion are not doing, don't do the data collection um, that we've been analyzing. It's It's been done by the Findex, which does not, um, does not break down the data by um, what type of an account it is um, in terms in the, the usage data is not broken down by what type of account it is. We do know how many people have um, other types of accounts besides um, bank accounts. Um, and one of the big stories is how few people have mobile only accounts. But we've also seen separate data that shows that um, even when people have mobile accounts, the um, the frequency of use of those mobile accounts is not that great. And it's in particular, um, that's being used for um, the types of, of money transfer transactions that occur kind of irregularly as opposed to every day. And so it really points to the question of um, having a, um, a, a merchant acceptance environment, if you could call it, I mean, the, the, to call it that, um, in which um, the, the, the merchants that people transact with day to day use um, electronic payment mechanisms and therefore those mechanisms flow through accounts and, and if the merchant acceptance environment is rich then um, then people will be naturally using their accounts much in a much different way whether they're mobile accounts or traditional bank accounts um, and so one of the things that I think is starting to happen but is to me surprisingly slow to happen has been um, efforts to uh, to get merchants signed up as um, able to accept electronic payments and you know, there are quite a few issues around that and the motivations of mo merchants to do that and the, the, the terms on which that sign up is offered um, being sufficiently attractive to make the, the merchants want to do that. But anyway, I, that's, that does seem to be the, the hurdle that needs to be crossed before there will be a genuinely cash light um, and um, high account usage um, ecosystem. Great. Thank you, Beth. And there's another question 
from Motaz El Taba. Do you think that adding the number of transactions of technology such as e-wallet would improve the account activity ratios? And I can open that to the floor and or Beth if anybody has a uh, answer to that question. Hi, Motaz. I think that's sort of the same question that was just um, that I just talked about. That, um, but let me know if, if I didn't already cover it. And then Bunmi Lawson has quite a few questions, and I think it might be easier. Bunmi, if you're still on the line, would you like to go ahead and ask those questions and make a few comments? Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, well, I had a number of um, comments um, about the study. I think it was a good presentation, and certainly we need this data to see and rank where we are in terms of financial inclusion. Um, one question I had was um, the issue of technology. And um, first, I want to talk about the agent with the mobile phone. It was indicated as having no cost. And um, sometimes what I see, find in Nigeria is that the cost of providing service to those who are financially excluded is quite high. So the services are quite expensive. So some of the things that may be restricting the usage of accounts, for instance, may be that it is expensive for those transactions to be carried out. So I was wondering if there's been any study that showed that it was because the product doesn't meet the customer's needs that they are not using it or that it's too expensive to use, so that may be the thing. You indicated that the cost of um, an agent with a mobile phone is zero, whereas it, in Nigeria particularly where you see that mobile phone and um, mobile money hasn't really taken off. The cost of providing an agent is quite expensive, especially in the rural areas. The um, speaker from, um, I think, Vision, also spoke about the fact that who is using the technology and what we find in Nigeria is that mobile phone and all of that is still used by those who are actually already financially included and have high income because the cost to provide an agent is expensive for the software, the training and so on to the agent. So why is there an assessment that the cost of an agent with a mobile phone is zero? Um, and I think lastly, um, is the issue on um, trying to scroll through all the things that I um, read. I think those are the points that I find, you know, pertinent, and I would love your comments on those. Okay, I think that's um, a very interesting question as to whether it's cost or, or kind of the value of the services that's preventing people, and um, I haven't seen anything on that. Let me just say on the cost being zero, that is a marginal cost assuming it this these are that that chart is from CGAP a uh, CGAP study and it's showing the marginal cost of adding um, adding the access point and it assumes that you or that there is already an agent with a mobile phone and you're just adding the um, the mobile money account to that so that would be an MNO that already has a network of agents and you're piggybacking on that existing network to add the mobile uh, money technology to it um, and that and that is zero but I think you're right that you know that some of the things that you're raising are some of the issues that are that are um, the real ones to tackle and managing agent networks is um, uh, it's certainly both costly and um, and difficult to do well and I think the um, the, the agent, the costs of managing a agent networks are a major explanation for the um, for the pace being slower than um, than desired in some cases. Great, thank you, Bunmi. Thank you, Beth. And I have one more question here. It's more of a clarification. Uh, have you been talking about the customer's data and their privacy? What do you refer by adequate privacy, and which data should be shared and which shouldn't? Um, I'll Turn that maybe to Beth for a reaction uh, or anyone else on the line. How, how do we know if anybody else wants to answer while they raise their hand? Okay. Um, Does anybody else want to address that question? 
I mean, I'll just start off by saying that um, that it is a difficult question, and um, what we what we um, what we see when we talk to clients about their consumer protection concerns, um, people who are from the base of the pyramid typically don't care about the privacy issues that, you know, when you sort of list all the possible consumer protection concerns that they have, privacy never shows up. Um, and if it's brought up, it's not, it's not ranked highly. Um, at the same time, it's also clear that misuse of data can harm people. Even, uh, and we see misuse of PIN numbers. We see um, uh, interactions with agents that don't um, use their use the transactions properly can be um, can be harmful. Um, over some of the over the counter agent transactions that happen um, have a risk that is related to um, breach of data privacy. Um, but certainly, as you get more sophisticated, and this is this is showing up in in markets like Latin America and Eastern Europe. Um, the availability of the data um, allows for much more aggressive marketing. Um, and you know, do you want someone to be able to um, target you for uh, sales pitches based on your um, based on your usage of of um, data. And certainly when we get to more sophisticated markets, you have identity theft problems and, and, and things like that. And the answers to how to solve this don't seem to me to be very clear. Um, there's the idea of um, people should own their own data, but functionally that doesn't seem to um, translate very easily into a solution. Um, certainly people need to be able to have the um, have the ability to determine how their data is used, but what we see a lot of, and you know, have all done ourselves many times, is to click on OK um, it, to something that allows people to use your your uh, data, um, because if you don't click on OK, you don't get the service. And so, um, you know, some of the things that are required. Um, in terms of um, getting client permission can essentially kind of become just a checkbox exercise in which the client doesn't really know what's happening. In other words, I don't have um, a good answer to that question. <laughs> it seems like a problem to me. Great. Thank you so much, Beth. And thank you, everyone, for your questions and comments. Um, so we would encourage you to stay involved with FI 2020 Week beyond this webinar and help us spread the word and spread the word to your networks. And we'd especially love to hear your answer to the question, what is an important action needed in your country or industry segment to advance financial inclusion? Uh, we, have we have featured answers from Ajay Banga and Tim Adams on the FI 2020 Week website. Please submit your answers to this question and a headshot to Elise McGrath at a McGrath at axion.org. And we'd also encourage you to follow us on social media at hashtag FI2020 to see other activities that are going on throughout the week. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'd like to quickly mention that the application is now live for the 2016 program which is being held from March 28th to April 2nd in Boston, Massachusetts. And as always, we welcome your referrals. You can direct them to the program homepage or feel free to pass along my email address. And finally, to help you all stay connected with each other, if you haven't already, we'd love for you to join the All Alumni Group on LinkedIn that now has over 220 members. Uh, I'll, I'll be sure to follow up in the coming days with all the important links and information shared during this webinar, so no need to write it down. Uh, we wish you all a fanta fantastic day or evening, depending on where you are, and thanks again for joining us.